Welcome to Amateur Radio Roundtable. Today is Tuesday, April the 14th, 2015. This webcast is every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Central Time, 0100 UTC on Wednesdays on W5KUB.com. In addition to watching us at W5KUB.com, this program is also being simulcast on shortwave radio station WTWW on 9930 kilohertz. We should have shortwave listeners tuning in from a number of countries. We had uh, signal reports from as far away, away as Australia last year. Uh, because of our shortwave broadcast, we're going to try to figure out a way to start including segments about shortwave listening. We invite every listener to join the webcast at W5KUB.com if you can. So if everybody goes there, they should see the live video from the show. In addition, please join our chat room. All you have to do is put your name in the user box. You don't need a password. Just enter your name and click the sign in button. And we'd love to hear from you in the chat room. Give us your location and the signal report. We'd like for you to join our Facebook group. Just search for W5KUB in Facebook and follow us on Twitter at W5KUB. And also follow the QSO Radio Show with Ted Randall at QSO Radio Show. Uh, tonight we have a great lineup and each one of you can join the live webcast in the second part of the show if you have a camera and a Google Plus account. We will provide a link to click on that will allow you to come into the webcast. We've got a special segment that's going to come in. We just uh, scheduled it in the last minute. Uh, it's uh, a video, uh, a live video coming in from uh, NAB. That's the uh, National Association of Broadcasters uh, out in Las Vegas. So that's coming up here, uh, probably the first segment. And then uh, we will move into uh, our other regularly scheduled guest. So am I, am I actually live? Can you, you guys are. hear me okay? You're, you're live. You're live, uh, Matt. Well, well Tom... Uh, Obviously, I'm KG4WXX. This is W1WHN. And then we have some real brains over here. W3EEE. Uh, echo, echo, echo. <laughs> e -E -E. I think I mean. Okay, EEE. -E -E. They're saying EEE -E -E back to you. Um, so these guys here, uh, uh, Mike, is uh, he works for a company called Wheatstone, and they make audio processing, and you guys can all probably probably see all these wonderful blinking lights. I think to um, let these two ping pong back and forth on what this stuff is, to give you an idea of what you could see here at NAB if you were to decide to come, would be the best way to do this. So I'll turn it up to one of you guys. You guys pick who's going. And sure, I'll, there. I'll take this side. You take that side. We've got side. here, these are mic processors. and These are devices that you would see in radio stations where... Um, you have uh, disc jockeys on the air. I know that sounds foreign now. There's not a lot of disc jockeys left in radio stations. But we do have microphone processors that tailor the voice before it goes on the air. This is our M1 mic processor, and it's got a bunch of knobs on the front for control, like a traditional processor. A lot of the digital processors nowadays are behind a, um, a, a face that has no controls on it. But the M1, we still have one mic processor that does it. As controls for input and output. Now, there's a lot of hams, I hate to interrupt, that are using sure. the M1 for uh, mic processing. That's right. They're, not only are there are a lot of hams using an M1 for mic processing, but tomorrow night there'll be one more using for mic processing. So we're going to be giving away one of these M1s at the ARRL reception tomorrow evening. So we have the M1. The M2 is a two mic processor channel. And then the M4 has four mic processors built in. Steve, you want to take over the uh, FM processors here? big, shiny, blinky lights, and I have it on really good authority that it actually does interesting stuff to audio as well. What is an air chain processor? It's one of these. The idea is it, it's a twofold thing. The first is you have to keep the transmitters legal, um, keep them within 75 kilohertz deviation or you lose your license. And at the other end, uh, you can never be sure what signal levels are going to be coming from a studio. The guy might not be able to drive the console properly, and the levels could be low, the levels could be high, and this takes care of that. It, it makes sure that the signals are at a consistent level. And in between those two things, the legalistic and the, and the taking care of business is what we in, in the trade call magic. Uh, by the miracle of multiband signal processing, several layers of it, 
very care very carefully intertwined. Uh, um, there's the loudness of the signal on the air can be made much, much louder than it would be straight off the CD. Oh my gosh, am I dating myself? Or the file. Uh, in fact, the, dis the difference can be really quite startling. Um, if you take a, an ordinary program, an ordinary piece of music off a CD and pass it through one of these, uh, it sounds much livelier, much louder, much more dense and, and more exciting. It is, of course, possible to completely overdo this and it sounds like can I say rude words I won't but you get the general idea of things um, but used within the proper constraints these things make a real difference to the way things sound on the air so uh, I say now Steve give your call sign again so everyone can, can see your face and your call sign okay whiskey three echo 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 everyone needs to go right now and look him up on uh, QRZ so he gets some more hits um, in uh, you guys also run these guys. Is one of these your AM processor that you have here? Brand new. AM55. So you guys want to talk about that? And if any of you cam operators out there want a professional broadcast processor, this guy here would definitely be it right there. So. Oh, yes, that's the one. The AM55 the AM is hot off the press. It has a five-band AGC, five-band compressor. Also has a five-band limiter. All the uh, processing tuned for maximum optimization of the limited bandwidth that AM can have. There's a front panel, easy setup, easy setup. And we also have, and I, I opened it up here because I know it's supposed to be good. We have a GUI here, and here's the full control of the AM55. Well, hey, it's a very, hey, man, very powerful processor. Should be shipping sometime this summer. It's a brand new product. Literally, this is the first time it's been shown in public, and it's behaving very well. I should say. So uh, you were asking me a question here, Tom. What was yeah, that? Matt. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, th that limiter uh, that he's got there, uh, maybe we need to get one for our webcast here. We have trouble keeping our levels uh, the same, man. <laughs> Tom is asking to get one of those to, to level out the, the podcast, or not podcast, but the video thing he's doing right now. Oh, we've, so. we've got processors that could do that. <laughs> Probably wouldn't want the AM when we have the FM25. Might be a better. Choice. Well, uh, hey, hey, Ted, uh, Ted, you're uh, you're on here, Ted. You're a broadcaster. This processor is also an AM processor and an FM processor, and, and one of the last AM processors that can do AM stereo. The VPA, we, we've been making it for years, and it's been a very popular processor, and we're still selling them, and uh, we still can't build them fast enough. Yes, there are streaming modes in there as well. That's right. Uh, I mean, I'm, admittedly, now nowadays. Uh, there, there isn't very much in the way of low bitrate streaming, but this was designed to optimize audio to be sent uh, on podcasts and, and, stream, and live streaming. Uh, I, I tend to regard streaming codecs as boxes containing an angry no. And the idea of the box here is to uh, not aggravate the no. It attenuates things which would make the no do stupid stuff. And, and feeds the known stuff that it likes to leave you alone so that it passes the best audio. It's a, an extremely good streaming processor. And uh, a set of Ginshu knives comes free with it too. Well, I think at this point, we, Tom, we'll have to probably say these guys have got uh, some dinners with uh, some of their clients and we'll kind of walk around. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, hey, just uh, tell them that was very interesting, and uh, they're getting a lot of comments in the chat room. Uh, a lot of people like the blinking lights. Uh, everyone in the chat room saying they love the blinking lights, and thank you for taking your time. So, thank you for yeah. having us. Um, thank I guess you. We can, um, I guess I don't know of anything else at this point that we can really do from here today. So. All right, well, let me, let me just uh, see if uh, Ted's working here. Ted, are, are you in there? I'm still here. I've just been watching. All right, Matt, are you hearing Ted? Barely. Barely. Okay. Well, Well, I, I, let, let, let me say this, and that is, I think my favorite audio processor in the broadcast arena is here, the let's, let's uh, just walk this way while they're, they while they're talking. They we'll, we'll see you guys later. Ago. Take it easy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. sound like a million dollars. And, uh, so, of course, most FM stations are worth more than a million dollars. But they really do a fine job on the audio, and they keep it musical so it doesn't sound all squashed and smashed. And, uh, like, you hear a lot of, a lot of radio broadcast so, audio. Today. So I'm going inter to interrupt real quick. If you guys look over here. All right. Here, well, uh, is, uh, Ted, I, I, I think he's. I think Matt's hearing you, but uh, probably not uh, very loud. M Matt is walking. And I'm sure there's noise there. Uh, he's showing us some of the uh, stuff there at the uh, uh, NAB right a, now. This is a uh, Jam Pro antennas, and you can see there's an FM 
several FM bays. Uh, uh, there's a Yagi FM broadcast, Yagi antenna. Um, there's a uh, high power. It says high power UHF slot. I have no idea what band this is for, but it looks like I got to actually climb it. So. Just a quick rundown. Of course, the show, showroom floor has actually officially closed, so everything is, is closed down. We're going to walk this way. Uh, um, you can see off here in the distance, there's Sunheiser. Um, Sunheiser obviously makes microphones and, and things of that nature. There's Continental Electronics, which is what WTWW is running off of right now. Um, and uh, we'll go this way. Um, over here is, I have no idea what these guys do. They're, they do something. Looks like here's some dummy loads. Here's a fairly large dummy load here. And then here's a much larger dummy load over here. Um, here's some smaller versions. So kind of gives you all an idea of the size of dummy loads that can be used in FM, AM broadcast. Uh, here's a Audio Technica, their booth here. Natural broadcast. We were trying to get some of their their uh, engineers to talk with us, but they were a little uh, busy tonight in an SBE function. A lot of people were doing that tonight. Well, yeah, and this uh, was a, a last minute. This was a last minute deal too that we uh, pulled together. So here's a transmitter. This is I. This is a solid state. I don't even know what if this is an AM or an FM. It's I only guess we look back on the front with the way these things are today. It's a little bit of to figure that out. Let's see here. It's the, it's the G, GV10. I have no idea what the GV10 is. Um, FM. It's an FM? Does it say how, how much power output it is? No. They just have it tuned over here tonight. Probably 10. So, we'll walk over here. Here's another in V10. And uh, you can see the inside. There's... No tubes. It's all solid state modules. He's probably pull out, pull in. One of the not tell guys just looked at me kind of funny as I was doing that, like he wants to kill me. So I think we should move along before I get in trouble here. Uh, he should know that I'm trying to steal a tube. So. Nice to see you. And of course, in broadcast today, we have all kinds of things like streaming. But let's go this way where RBR is. RBR is an Italian-based company makes FM transmitters and exciters. It's a little bit smaller uh, for you guys to be able to, to be able to see. Here's a RBR exciter here. Um, if I press the button, it should light up. You should be able to see the front display on it. So it would say frequency, power output, reflected power, uh, the type of audio input. Um, I'm, I haven't actually seen this version before, but I guess I can read it pretty well. But We'll look over here. Here's some larger RBR transmitters. That was an FM exciter. This looks like to be a much larger um, transmitter. So, um, yeah, let's keep moving. Um, so, the booths this year at NAB were kind of spread out quite differently. You have a lot of broadcast. Uh, FEMA is over there. If you guys want to we'll just, I mean, obviously everything's closed down, and we're probably going to get kicked out of here pretty soon, Tom. So, yeah, we just um, lost uh, we just lost your video. There, it's back on now. Okay, so FEMA has a booth here. Uh, it looks like, and maybe we should talk to them about having hams develop their EAS system to where it actually works. And yeah, I've been playing EAS EAS sounds all day. Uh, here is Comrex. Comrex makes um, uh, they make phone systems. You can see their their broadcast phone system. That's how they do multi line. Um, Phones and the multi-line phone systems, like how a talk show does their their talking and things of that nature, it gives you a very quick idea. They have a new system called Live Shot. It's obviously off because the floor is closing at this point. Well, Matt, uh, but, check with them. Check with them and see if they'll donate one for the show. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll give that a, I'll give that an attempt. Um, and then uh, as we exit this hall. This is one hall. I, I guess, what is it, about 12 football fields of technical stuff? Yeah, the latest yes. and great. It's about 12 football fields of the latest and greatest technology. And one of those today is drones. Uh, GoPro has a booth over here. There's a whole drone section, but this section here is not uh, 
a big drone section. And, of course, all of us hands that enjoy drones, me being one of those. Um, you can look over here. There's a pretty large drone over here. Um, my company looks like Free Fly. Free Fly. Is, and um, these are the kind of drones you would see, like, if someone's doing, like, a... Uh, like a movie or something along those lines, and they need extremely high-quality high video, you can get an idea. Can, I don't know if you can see that, Tom, how large that guy is. That That is a big drone and a big camera. That actually is not the largest drone we have seen here. Uh, I have seen some some ones that are bigger in the, uh, in the uh, drone section, which is... I mean... I saw one that was the size of a car. One of them actually looked like a uh, like a uh, military drone um, with a small prop on the back of it. Let's walk over here. Uh, probably one of the more famous uh, drone manufacturers is here called DJI. They're over here. And uh, I think at that point we'll go over there and say hello, see if their market manager is here. I've been told a rumor that he is a ham operator as well. And if he's here, we'll say hello. If not, I'll turn it back over to you guys, and we'll probably sign off from NAB here. Um, this may be a little difficult to figure out, so I'm going to... I've never been there, but it looks like a very large place, and oh, it looks like some place I'd like to be at. Oh, yes, it definitely is. So you can see all the DGIs and then flying them inside this caged area, I guess that's with the safety of the human beings, so uh, let's walk over here and see if their, their marketing manager is here. Uh, in terms of uh, being able to fly, please? No, no, I mean, five, five. Give me five. No, I'm not. Okay. Thank you. All right, so the guy we were looking for is not there, so uh, we'll exit this exit here, and I'll let uh, uh, Tom, I'll let you. My dad picking up here. I can hardly hear him, so. Um, again, that is just a, you know, what, what, what are we even here? Ten minutes? You know, that is a ten-minute preview as the show floor is closing, so it's kind of impossible to see uh, how much is here in that ten minutes. I mean, it's like, uh, it's insane. I mean, everything from drones to small converters to audio processors to all that stuff is here under one roof. Yeah. Everyone, all the engineers in America and around the world, I mean, people come from China, the manufacturers come from China, uh, manufacturers you never even heard of will be, are here. Well, so. I, I hear it's the place place to be, and uh, thank you very much for the tour. Now, um, one, more, one more thing, one yeah. more thing. Tomorrow night, there is a ham reception where all the American hams uh, do come to, and some from out of the country, and we fill up a room, a big, huge ballroom, I would say, probably twice this size here of ham operators that work in the industry and everyone from you know fox news new york to abc to cbs uh affiliates to los angeles california i mean you name it they're there if they're a ham operator so and they're here at nab so i hope uh we'll get to see some of those guys very soon so well uh, shoot some shoot some video clips of that and uh we'll uh, we'll try to run them here hey one last question real quick we don't have a lot of time but uh, you guys sure. get to area <laughs> Area 51 today. Uh, actually, we did that last night. We went to Groom Lake last night. I have an area that we go and we look, and we saw some very interesting lights, and I'll try to send you guys that uh, that time lapse once I finish it. But we got um, some really interesting glowing lights and flashes from the ground that these things were doing. The best way I could describe it is these things move with uh, the speed of like a, like a fighter jet, but uh, had the agility of a drone because you know a drone can move from this way up and down um, I would definitely have to say whatever it was was man-made I don't want to say it was ET uh, if ET was flying those things and going around and doing what they were doing then uh, it really didn't make sense to me but you know obviously whatever they were flying was really cool um, can't 
don't know what I, I mean, if I were to speculate, I would say it was some kind of anti-gravity uh, airplane, judging by how fast and how quickly, because they would have to control gravity to be able well, to make those things. Well, that since you, uh, you did not know what they were, I guess we can still call them UFOs, right? That would be correct. And it is off, we were off the extraterrestrial highway, so there is that problem. All right. So. Well, hey, Matt, thank you very much. Uh, Ted, you want to say goodbye there to your son? You guys, uh, you guys be careful tonight now and don't get in any trouble because I don't have a whole lot of bail money on this end here. <laughs> All right. We're going to have to work on our audio connection between you back uh, uh, to Las Vegas here. He said uh, don't get in any trouble. Uh, he, didn't well, we're have not much, he, he didn't have much bail money. Well, uh, we are going to go meet another ham friend of ours that is a cab driver here in about 10 minutes. Uh, we're going to meet him on a repeater, and he's going to go take us somewhere to have dinner. His name is Tom K. as well, and he is uh, KG7HUP, so he's a cab driver here in Las, in Las Vegas. So, All right. Well, Matt, thank you very much uh, for showing us the, the NAB. Uh it, it looks great. Yeah, All right, you. you have a good night. You have a good night. All right. Okay. Uh, well, that was uh, that was Matt and uh, David out at the NAB. Uh, lucky dogs. Uh, I guess Ted sent them out there. I don't know why Ted. Ted, why did you go with? Why didn't you go with them, Ted? Oh, we just, you know, we've got to have somebody here to take that's, uh, that's on the air. And uh, three of us, one location at uh, at one time without uh, without it creating a problem. Should something go down here at the shortwave or some of the other broadcast stations, somebody's got to be here. So we were elected. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Well, that was a, that was a great tour, and maybe we'll get to see those uh, videos he shot out there uh, uh, at an Area 51. So um, let let's see. We've got our next guest uh, here. First of all, Ted, I'm glad you were able to join us tonight. Uh, Ted Randall, folks, is uh, going to be a co-host of our show, and there's a picture of Ted. We we the, the last time we tried uh, bringing Ted in, he broke the camera, so we're having to use a still picture right now, but uh, Ted's going to be with us when he can. Uh, let me now move right along here, and... Uh, let's see what's next on the agenda here. Uh, the the segment you just saw was not in, in the uh, in the programming, so we're having to adjust just a little bit. Okay, so uh, first, let me just say, uh, any shortwave listeners out there, if you're listening, you're on WTWW, coming from Lebanon, Tennessee, uh, on shortwave 99.30 kilohertz, and uh, I've been seeing some signal reports in the chat room, but. If you're joining joining us tonight by shortwave, and if you're near a computer, go to w5kub.com, w5kub.com, and uh, join in, and you can watch the video with us, and you can get in the chat room and uh, talk to us. Send us a signal report and tell us where you are. Also, uh, uh, if you will, uh, uh, you can follow us on uh, uh, Twitter. Uh, at W5KUB, and also uh, QSO Radio is at QSO Radio, I believe is the address. So let's move on now to uh, our first guest of the night, which is now our second guest. Uh, this is Don, K3LNE, up in Likens, Pennsylvania. Uh, Don was a Boy Scout in his youth and is now involved with his son in scouting. One of the areas that we're going to be talking with Don uh, about is his involvement in helping the Boy Scouts to understand and use ham radio in their activities. Uh, he's been a big supporter of the youth forums for years. He's traveled to all three high adventure Boy Scout camps, uh, which include the uh, Sea Base in Key, uh, Key West, Philmont, New Mexico, and the Northern Tier in Canada. He's also participated in the, the National Jamboree in Virginia 
And about five years ago, Don restarted the Jamboree on the Air uh, with his club, and he's fully integrated the Radio Merit Badge into it. So uh, that's a few of the things he's done on the, the uh, scout side. Don has also been a paramedic for over 30 years. So, Don, uh, you're a very busy guy, and uh, I just wonder where you have time uh, to – how you find time to do all this? And uh, there you are. You're on the show now. we got you on there. Hey, Tom, how you doing? Doing good. So uh, how's things up in uh, Pennsylvania? Uh, great weather today. Uh, looking for maybe a little rain, but uh, having a fantastic time. Thanks for uh, inviting me on the show. Okay, well, great. Well, hey, let's, uh, uh, let's talk a little about the scouts and what you're doing for the scouts and uh, the Jamboree uh, uh, on the air and just a lot of things. I think you've got some pictures or slides for us, right? I do have some slides, and uh, Tom, I'd ask you to uh, get ahead of the slides because of uh, delay here. Uh, just slow me down a little bit. I'll try and talk slow. I did want to welcome all the shortwave listeners around the world. Um, Jamboree on the air, which is Joda. Uh, I'm going to switch over to some slides here and talk about that. And let me do that. And get my PowerPoint running here. Hopefully you can see that. Well, let's see. Not yet. Uh, the little clock is spinning. Uh, maybe okay. we'll pop in here in a minute. I still, all right, now I see it. Go right ahead. Okay. Well, very good. Um, for all the listeners, uh, again, as Tom said, my background is, in, uh, is actually in emergency uh, medical services. Been doing that for quite a while. And uh, as Tom said, I'm visited and i've been very lucky to visit all actually four of the high adventure bases now that uh, the scout is off uh, the boy scouts are operating as tom said in uh, sea base in florida philmont and in northern tier and the important reason for mentioning those is that on all of those adventures i have carried with me my ht vx7 uh radio and used it extensively at all locations and wait for the next slide to come up. Yep, it's there. Let's see. Well, oh, no, no delay here. Let's see. And uh, it's coming up on your end there. Actually, no. Uh, I see a uh, looks like a, a picture of a. Uh, Rectangle. Right. Well, let me stop sharing and start it again okay, here. Okay, go right ahead. Uh, go right ahead. See if I have a, an issue on this end. One of the important things for everybody to be thinking about is um, how many of you were scouts, uh, how many of you know scouts that are involved, or even many of you have um, been involved, got in radio because of voice scouts. I'll talk about that hopefully in a minute here. Okay. And let's see what you're getting now. So I can't see the, uh, the text uh, input, but I'm sure many of you have been involved in scouting. And uh, is that what we have up now, Tom? That's it, yes. Okay. So let's see if we can move forward here a little bit. And on the other side, of course, uh, I'm of age now to potentially have uh, children and uh, grandchildren. And uh, many of you may be involved in scouting from that perspective, too. But radio scouting uh, is referred to as radio scouting covers a couple different areas. And uh, some of those are, some of you mo may know, and I'll concentrate on that tonight, is Jamboree on the Air, or some refer to it shortened as Joda. 
and that is the third weekend in October every year. I've been running for 57 years. The Radio Merit Badge, which uh, we'll talk about also, Amateur Radio Operating Strip, which uh, some of you are certainly entitled to wear on your Scott uniforms if you don't know about, and the Morse Code Interpreter Strip. And the National Scott Jamboree is included in, in this also. I won't have time to talk about that tonight, though. So what is Chambery on the Air? This is a worldwide event. Again, third weekend in October. Started in 1958. It is actually the largest scouting event in the world, with over 700,000 scouts participate yearly, and 22,000 radio amateurs in order to pull this whole thing off. 12,000 different stations across uh, the world, including, of course, the U.S., where I focus my attentions. And covers 150 different countries. Now, the symbol you may see to the right there, which is the international label, the JOTA and the JOTAI, which stands for Jamboree on the Internet, was started in order to include that portion of ham radio. And so this is truly an international event covering all modes and all bands. All it is to promote conversations with other scouts and amateur radio operators around the world, of course, across the country. Gives them a glimpse of other cultures, regional differences, and scouts get exposed to technology, fun, and man magic of amateur radio. It's a natural starting point for uh, the Radio Merit Patch. And we run our Joda event, and you see the patch here from last year, from the 57th event last year is a three-day camporee. So we start Friday, Saturday, and, and leave on Sunday morning. My troop, uh, 151 in Millersburg, Pennsylvania, my radio club, the Berry Mountain Amateur Radio Club, or BMARC, uh, sponsors the event, and we've been doing it for about five years. And we focus it around the radio merit badge and the skills uh, oriented to achieve that. So we do some antenna building, radio direction finding, CW signaling not only with audio, but also with um, signaling device such as flashlights and uh, mirrors, do some soldering. We have a simulated search and rescue. And unusual in scouting, then Saturday night we have the ability for the scouts to stay up all night and make contacts. And of course that results in lots of contacts and awards being given out Sunday morning. We operate on all modes, multi-band, and some internet modes. And I want to thank all of our amateur supporters that have come out and turn out each year to help support that. So here's a few pictures from our event. Scott's having some fun, having conversations out in the field. But essentially, we run ours as a radio merit badge and uh, event and as a field day. Now you can see the tent city on the left-hand side like most of our Jamboree events, so the camps, the scouts camp out, prepare their own food. And of course, associated with that is a good flag raising in the morning before we get started. And here we see uh, scouts working on CW, uh, and that turns out to be one of our still most popular stations. The kids are just fascinated with CW and uh, participate in that all day long. In amongst all the skills, we run the um, Radio Merit Badge uh, classroom sessions. So they go from a skill session to a classroom session and back and forth. On the right, we see that they're building antennas. So we do a small little uh, two meter with a twin lead, which allows all the scouts to take home an antenna with them. And of course, they get to make contacts on that. On the left, we do some radio direction finding. And all of these skills come together for Saturday night after the campfire gets started, when it's dark, we have a simulated plane crash nearby. And what we do is we have the scouts have to find the plane crash by the radio direction finding, go out, locate the patients in the scene of the accident. And what you see here is the boys are working on what we use are rescue mannequins. Now, these mannequins simulate people. And they weigh approximately 150 pounds a piece. So once they find them, they have to signal back with their flashlights, Morse code, to say, send more help. We found them and start the process. So they do some first aid. 
They build their own litters and carry the patients back. Always a great time. And uh, we culminate that with a nice uh, round of applause and look at all the work that's been done. And then they begin making contacts. In addition to what they've done all day, they can stay up all night and make contacts if they want to. So here are some statistics about Chota. And uh, you'll note that in 2013, the latest statistics I have here, some of the numbers went down. But one of our biggest challenges is for the stations that are participating and not reporting their information. So we ask those stations that do report and do participate to report their information. Planning a Jota event. I get a lot of calls, and I wrote an article specifically for this. And the quote at the top of my article, which you'll find on the K2PSA site, is even in today's technology, the magic of being able to string up a wire, connect it to a radio, and talk directly to a foreign country, all on the power of a light bulb, still amazes me. And every time we do Jota, this event amazes me. So if you're interested in those tips on getting started, setting up a, a Jota event, go to the k2bsa.net site and you'll find that under event tips. So how do you organize a Jota event? You can work with your local scout council, district, or unit. Again, go to the K2BSA site. There's lots of information there. Line yourself up with an existing scouting event that happens on Jota weekend. You don't have to go to the event. You can be there to participate for contacts. Go where the scouts are. Support the activity, Camp Ree, or other events that might be going on in your area. There's lots of resources available. Go to the internet, Google search, and you'll find lots of stuff on the scouting website, on the ARRL site, on the K2BSA site, all sorts of calendars, program ideas, activity books, participation certificates, all sorts of stuff. So it's all out there if you're looking for some help. I put this picture up in, in particular because getting on the air during Joda really demonstrates the hobby very well. And we have a lot of people come in. We always have the press come in, write an article up about the event. Uh, and it's a great community event to display the teamwork and the uh, working together from the amateur radio community, the uh, supporters out there from the commercial side, and, of course, scouting. I did want to mention Ray Novak, N9JA, um, from ICOM, has been always a big supporter of AMA Radio and the youth format in Dayton. And just to note, ICOM has created 10 complete radio stations that they will loan out to councils for radio events all during the year. And of course, those are available uh, for your JOTA event also. So if you don't have equipment, there's still not even an excuse for that. So what's this mean to you? How do you want to help? Many of you remember, may remember this radio merit badge. I want you to draw a note there, if you can see at the bottom, 1927, the radio merit badge pamphlet first came out, almost at the beginning of radio. So we've had it for a long time. Some of you may recognize some of these radio merit badge books as the ones you learned on and got you interested in radio, maybe Morse code, and maybe even the career that you have today. So today, Radio Merit Badge is still really important. You see the latest revision includes digital modes, satellite, um, just about everything you can think of in what we do. And it's a, it's a very good resource manual itself. The Radio Merit Badge itself is a great introduction to radio, broadcast, shortwave listening, and ham radio options. There's actually three options in Radio Merit Badge. It can be typically completed in a day-long workshop uh, with slide presentations and skill presentations. And at the National Jamboree, they used a four-hour time frame to conduct this. It needs a little heads-up work, but it can be done. So there has, has been a strong interest in Radio Merit Badge, and I want to draw your attention to this slide here. That from 2004 to 2013, over 60,000 radio merit badges were earned. So I want to thank all those counselors out there who are putting in their effort and time to help out those scouts earn those. Other things that I want to point out to you is if you're an amateur radio operator, here are 14 merit badges that you certainly could help out with from your expertise in helping out 
from the radio side, the safety side, and the fun side of helping with these as a radio, as a nerve badge counselor. In addition, here's an ele- other 11 ones that I tie in from a safety and a management of troop activities from backpacking to climbing and white water that ham radio fits into just perfectly. The marriage between ham radio and scouting is just unbelievable. And if you haven't checked lately, there's over 130 merit badges now for scouts to work on. What about operating a summer camp station? Youngsters on the Air, which goes on in December to introduce scouts and young people to amateur radio. Get on the air events. You can create one yourself. Mentoring. Be an Elmer. We always need those. And one of the latest things going on in Boy Scouts and technology is the STEM program for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Help come teach Morse code. Demonstrate contact to the ISS. And, of course, the amateur radio operator strip is stripped it is to recognize all those radio amateurs who are scouters also and proudly wear that on your uniform. Uh, it's both for adults and scouts themselves. And this goes back actually to the senior scout radio men strip back in the 1940s. So it's a natural follow on and over 6,800 of them have been uh, awarded or sold out to the local amateurs that are helping support. There is also Part of the interpreter strips, uh, the Boy Scouts has a set of strips that uh, is for foreign languages, uh, Braille, a variety of other interpreter strips in order to promote communication. And very recently, in the last few years, they added Morse code strip. So if you are proficient and you have a test to, to pass in order to earn this to wear on your uniform, uh, you can do that. If you notice the strip spells out, I'm sure all you CW operators already know, Morris. So, one more thing for your uniform. So there are lots of resources out there. Please use mine. I'm W3LNE at ARRL.net. If you have any other questions. And if you're interested in the slide presentation or other information, I can help you. Especially, I want to make a special note of Jim Wilson, K5. ND, who is at um, K2BSA, is the lead for the Boy Scouts for all things concerning amateur radio and uh, is the go-to guy within the BSA for for that. Tom, I wanted to say if people are interested, be happy to talk about some other future topics, perhaps Joda in detail, using amateur radio and troop activities and managing troops and having fun and adding another level of safety and security for your ventures. Amateur radio on high adventure treks, meaning when you're out in the wilds, what can you get a hold of? And whether it's HTs, repeaters, uh, CW, all of that is available. Teaching the radio mirror patch, STEM and amateur radio. So I'll take any questions at this point. And again, thanks. And I hope to see all of you out in Dayton. Well, there were uh, a few comments in the chat room. Uh, people were wishing that uh, they had Joda when they were, I guess, in scouting. Uh, several comments there. Uh, any last-minute questions for Don before we move on? Thank you, Don. That was a that was a great presentation there. What we'll do, we'll have you come back on a future show and uh, try to uh, zero in on some of this. So, that would be great, Tom. I'd be happy to do that. And again, uh, if anybody has any questions or want to contact me, W3LNE at ARRL.net. Um, stand ready, and uh, I really believe in the marriage of amateur radio and scouting as both a fun activity. Uh, it's another layer of safety for scouting events, and it's a great, great introduction for a lifelong hobby and potentially career. So, over to you, Tom. Well, okay. Uh, I, you gave your uh, email address out, so if anybody uh, needs to contact you to find out more about the subject, uh, they'll they'll be emailing you. And uh, we're running a little behind schedule, so I'm going to go ahead and get off of here, Don. Thank you very much for coming on tonight. Sorry we were late bringing you in, but uh, we thought we had a nice opportunity to bring something in uh, from uh, from uh, Las Vegas here. 
No problem, Tom. Thank you very much. Okay, well, let's see what we got going here now. Uh, Ted, are you still with us? I'm still here. Very, very interesting uh, guest, and uh, it was a, it was a really kind of cool listening to everything that he had to say about Jota. Okay, well, Ted, why don't you uh, why don't you uh, talk to us just for a moment? Uh, tell us uh, hey, a joke, or or tell us how this, tr- this short wave works while I get our next guest on. <laughs> a joke, okay. Oh, me. Uh, I don't know. I am, uh, I guess, uh, very, very intrigued. Have been ever since I was a kid with with shortwave radio. Uh, my dad had, had bought a uh, an old Gruno somewhere. I don't know where he got it, but he gave it to me when I was just a little kid, and um, I had the thing placed right by my bed on a chair and uh, listen to it, but I had to take it out of the case first, and then I had to remove all the tube shields because I wanted to see those tubes glow in the dark. And uh, I had a lot of fun listening to uh, Radio Havana, Cuba. You know, back then they didn't speak much English on Radio Havana, Cuba, but uh, it was interesting to listen to. But HCJB in Quito, Ecuador, and uh, from the island of the flamingos, Trans World Radio, Bonaire, Netherlands, and Tellys, they, uh, they had a big signal. And, uh, of course, on, on that radio, the, the ham, 40-meter ham band was about a sixteenth of an inch wide. But uh, I could hear some AM guys in there uh, talking, <laughs> and that was really, really intriguing. So you're going to have to jump in here and tell me when you've got your next guest lined up. Well, I, I think we, we just about have you. Martin, uh, I don't have your, your video. Is your video turned on? Uh, well, uh, Some, let's see, where do I need to... Well, let's think about this. Uh, I should be on now. There you go. Now we're now we're getting you in there. Hey, guys, uh, man, hey, hey, now don't fix your hair, Martin. You're looking okay. You should have done that before you got on here. All right, so... I was going to say, we don't need his voice on the air with my picture. That would scare everybody off. Oh, man, I want to tell you something. I, I think it's going to be good tonight. That's, I've been looking forward to this for a few for a long time here. Hey, guys, next uh, we have Martin F. Jew, K5FUL. Martin is the founder of MFJ Enterprises. Uh, MFJ was founded in 1972 by Martin. Uh, the, become, the company began its operations in a really small rented hotel room, but it has now grown over the years to be one of the largest producers of ham radio equipment. I'm thinking that probably at least 90% of all the ham stations around have some MFJ product in their shack. Uh, MFJ is also the parent company of Ameritron, uh, Mirage, uh, Vectronics, and High Gain. Uh, they've got about 200 dealers in the United States and about 40 dealers overseas. And on the personal side, Martin's family, uh, it, it was so great that they came here and brought Martin here. Well, I guess you came later, but the, if they hadn't come, Martin, you wouldn't have been here. But Martin's family was originally from mainland China. They came here in the 1860s, and uh, they uh, settled in a little small delta Mississippi town called Hollandale. And they came here to build the Union Pacific Railroad. So... Uh, then Martin came along. He grew up uh, in the Delta. Uh, his family had this small general store. I think that's where Martin learned all of his business skills. He later completed multiple degrees uh, in college to kickstart this great adventure called MFJ Enterprises. So hello, Martin. Welcome to the program. And uh, I know everybody knows you and everybody's been waiting to see you. Uh, How you doing? You, uh, Tom, and hello, Ted. How are y'all tonight? Doing real good, real good. I have to, I have to uh, interject something here in there for the folks that don't know. My very first introduction to MFJ was a little bitty CW filter that just worked incredible. And at some point tonight, Martin, I want you to tell the story how that thing came about. So Martin, did did you uh, did you hear that? Uh, he was talking about the CW filter. I think that was one of your first products. Is that how you got started? Well, it was. It was, and that that um, when uh, 
uh, I, I knew I was going to uh, go into some kind, some kind of a business and uh, had been a ham radio since I was um, a uh, teenager back in high school. And that was the, the area that I knew the best. So I decided to try to build something for uh, ham radio. And it was the CW filter, which, and this is goes back to 40 years ago when the op amps, uh, first came out and, uh, I built some CW filters based on that that had to be wired into the radio. Um, and we took out these little two inch by two inch ads in the ham radio magazines. And in a couple of years, we sold several thousand of those. Well, that was, uh, that was, uh, an interesting product. That was back then where people, uh, needed something to help help clean those CW signals up. Well, that's true. Those uh, radios back then, you could hear uh, so many stations at one time. <clears throat> well, hey, Martin, before we, before we get into a lot of your products, <clears throat> probably most people have heard the story, but we're on shortwave tonight. People hopefully around the world are listening to you, and I know they also use MFJ products. I know you have products for shortwave listeners. Let's talk a little about the real startup of MFJ. You started, tell us, you started in a hotel room, and didn't you get kicked out of that room? What happened? Well, yeah, um, I was uh, looking for a place to um, build these products, and I, I was building them in a garage apartment where I lived, and after a while, I rented this uh, hotel room in downtown Starkville, uh, which is where Mississippi State University is and which is uh, where I went to school. But anyway, we rented this hotel room for $16 a month, 50 cents a day. And uh, it was a room that couldn't rent out to anyone else, no bathrooms and just no furniture. And we started building the products there, uh, etching the PC boards and, um, drilling the boards and soldering it and shipping everything out. And um, I think the, uh, the the manager who was uh, running the hotel was renting that room to us on the side. And we were making so much racket and, um, uh, and uh, stinking up the place, he, he ran us off. Well, I was going to say the etching of those circuit boards probably didn't smell too good in, in a hotel or motel area. You're probably running his customers away. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, back then we were using ferric chloride. And that was really rough stuff. Oh, yeah. So, okay, so you got thrown out of the hotel room, but that was probably good for you. you it probably each time something like this happens, you do a little better. So where do you go from there? Uh, let's see. We found the back of a uh, guy in town who had a um, place where he did silk screening. And we rented just a small strip. It must have been six foot wide and maybe uh, 15 feet long and started building products there. And, they, and he kept going up on the rent. And we were paying him more rent, and he was renting that whole building for it. So we left there and uh, went to a trailer, and we outgrew the trailer, and we went back to that building and rented the entire back part of it and then the entire building. And after that, we uh, bought a building. It was an old skating rink and moved it, moved into there. So uh, the, the skating rink, I guess it gave you uh, uh, a lot more space. And, and, and it seems like to me, each time you start growing bigger and bigger, uh, how, many, how many products do you have now, do you think? Well, we have over 2,000 line items. Uh, that includes all the MFJ products, the Ameritron products, the high gain products, Cushcraft, Mirage, and Vectronics. Uh, there's just a uh, lot of pieces there. And 90% of those products are made right here in Starkville. 
Well, I, I, I know that uh, you're making a lot of products there now, uh, even your capacitors, your tuning capacitors. When I was down here, I saw uh, your your shop. You, you do a lot of your work. You, you, you've got a, the metal shop that uh, what punches the metal, bends the metal. You make your own cases, your silk screen. Uh, tell us about the different uh, functions there of your uh, company. Well, we... You're right. We have some computer controlled punch presses where we can take um, a sheet of aluminum the size of a door and just put it in the machine and uh, it'll punch out entire uh, cabinets. They're all still flat and um, there's multiple cabinets on one sheet and then we just kind of uh, bang it. And all these sheets will fall out, and then you bend it, and it takes to the uh, form of um, uh, of a cabinet, and then we six screen. Um, uh, but that's that's one part of it. The metal shop, we've got a complete machining shop. We uh, we can also do things like vacuum forming the uh, plastic enclosures for the automatic tuners and the loops and. Um, we have uh, uh, surface mount machines that will um, place these tiny surface mount components on PC boards. Uh, uh, for example, the uh, SWR analyzers we make have over 200 parts in it. It can place all of those parts in less than a minute. And that's, that's uh, is that a wave soldering machine? Well, that is a pick and place surface mount machine, but we also have wave soldering. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the wave soldering is uh, for soldering all the through hole components, and it you basically <clears throat> put a PC board on a um, conveyor belt and it floats over a continuous flow of solder and it solders all the components on the bottom of the board. Well, let me uh, let me jump in here with a question so we won't forget them, uh, and then we'll come back to your story there. Uh, one person is asking uh, into GYN is wanting to know why. M uh, let's see. No, no, no. This is a uh, W5TXR. He's wanting to know why you do not allow smaller ham shops the MFJ dealership. Well, we do have uh, uh, lots of smaller ham shops. Um, uh, I mean. It, um, so is there a size limitation or something? Or well, no. There's a there's a dollar limitation. You have to buy a certain amount. Okay, I got you. Yeah. And here's another uh, question from uh, into GYN. Uh, what's MFJ planning on doing about dealing with the lack of transmit tubes being produced? Okay. Well, we have uh, <clears throat> been building more and more solid state amps, uh, and not. Uh, only because the tubes are becoming harder to get, but also um, the trend has been uh, the hams just like the convenience of solid-state amps and not having to tune them and just much easier to use. Um, so uh, we're expanding our tuner line, I mean our amplifier lines, uh, more in the solid-state area. Okay. Okay. Um Tell us, uh, I, we just had a Memphis Ham Fest here, and you guys were here. Uh, uh, Richard came down and some of the other guys, and, and we got to see them and visit with them. Uh, I know you do a lot of Ham Fest every year, and you go, you guys go a long ways, don't you? Well, we do. You know, at one time, we did 45 to 50 Ham Fests a year. Um, we still do 25 to 30 a year. It's, it's just, uh, uh, you know, with covered the country all the way from here to Florida to the Northeast and we've gone out to the California uh, West Coast area but there's lots of ham fests in the southeast part of the country in fact there's there's ham fests every weekend all over the country yeah I know you guys really work hard to get in there the Memphis ham fest was only six hours long on Saturday and uh, you guys brought a lot of stuff in and you know, uh, it surprised. Well, it didn't surprise me because I've seen this before. But you know, MFJ said it brought a lot of uh, uh, products in and set up. 
but there were many, many other ham groups selling MFJ products right there all around you. So how does that work on your, your uh, you selling versus them selling? Well, when we go to Ham Fest, we have two functions. One is to display our products uh, because uh, the dealers don't, they, they can't carry off all of the products that we have. So we have them out available for the hams to pick up and play with. <clears throat> and if someone wants to buy something from us because it's not carrying them, uh, then we, we can sell it to them. But the other reason, other main reason that we go is that we act as a uh, warehouse uh, for the dealers. So if it doesn't have something to stop, Um, and so, so the ham can uh, can can buy it from them uh, at a uh, discounted price, and we don't compete uh, with the dealers by discounting our prices. We let the dealers do that. It's, it's our way of supporting them and this. Okay. Uh, let's see if uh, let's see if Ted Ted's always got a lot of good questions. Ted. Uh, talk to say something here to, uh, to to Martin. I know you've got some questions. Are you still there, Ted? Well, we may have lost Ted. I guess we've lost Ted. Oh, that, there he is. Uh, is that better? I, don't, I was having a little trouble here. I was going to say maybe uh, maybe we could ask Martin a little bit about the antenna analyzers, and the reason why I say that is because so many hams love tinkering with antennas and uh, I can't think of a better way to learn RF principles how RF travels and works and what causes it to leave the antenna go into the air than just hands on so uh, I think maybe if he talks a little bit about these antenna analyzers there's a lot of fellows out there I'm sure that are wondering what's the difference between one and the other and, and so on and so forth okay uh well, let's. I was. Uh, Martin, we're losing your audio. Let's see. Okay. Uh, I think it's back now. Okay. Well, it's not back. Okay. Now, Hello? now it's back. Let's try it. Okay. How about that? It's that sounding okay? good. So Ted was asking you about the uh, antenna analyzers. Okay. Oh, I was just going to uh, talk about how the antenna analyzer came about. I was at work. I had a workbench behind my desk that I just kind of tinker with and work on ideas as uh, as I got them. And uh, we had at the time a, an antenna bridge. It was a, a, uh, a bridge that would uh, allow you to measure the feed point resistance and it had a built-in oscillator in it. But it was a bridge. You had to turn a knob and balance the bridge to, to read the resistance. And I was sitting back there trying to figure out a way that you could measure the resistance without having to balance the bridge. <clears throat> and um, as I was working on it, and, and I had figured out a way to measure the resistance, but then I thought to myself, well, why don't we just measure SWR directly? And I was already using a... Uh, Wheatstone bridge to measure the resistance. So I put a meter across the, the uh, Wheatstone bridge and calibrated in terms of SWR, and that became the um, antenna analyzer. <coughs> um, the antenna uh, um, analyzer is a uh, very wide range oscillator and a me way to measure SWR the original one, and then we expanded it so that we could measure uh, not only the uh, SWR, but also the resistive part of the antenna impedance and the reactive part, which then became the antenna analyzer. And all these analyzers are based on measuring uh, those two quantities, those three quantities, are the resistance and the reactance, and all everything else is derived from those two measurements. <clears throat> um, but <clears throat> um, 
the main thing that you need to know about uh, these SWR analyzers is that it measures at the connector. And uh, if you put something in between the connector of the analyzer and the antenna, that transmission line is going to change it. So you need to keep that transmission line as short as you can. <clears throat> and um, one of the things um, uh, you should depend on is the SWR because the SWR s stays constant no matter where you are on that transmission line. I mean, it'll reduce if the transmission line is lossy and long, but the, basically the SWR stays the same. If you try to measure the resistance or the reactance, both of those would change uh, according to the length of the line, unless you have a half wavelength. Now, we brought a new analyzer out, our um, new MFJ226, where you can calibrate it at the end of a transmission line, and it will read whatever it is at uh, uh, the end of that transmission line or wherever you calibrate it. And it will also read a sign of the reactance. That is, it will tell you if it is inductive reactance or capacitive reactive. Uh, okay. So, hey, Ted, have you been down to visit uh, with uh, Martin down at his uh, offices? No, we, we, we've never been to Mississippi, but boy, I want to go. Uh, I want to see his uh, his facility there. But you know, uh, I have and I own a, uh, a Maritron. I believe mine is the AL-1200. And um, I frankly, I just love the thing. I mean, I've built amplifiers. I've had 811 amps. I've had 3-500 amps. and uh, But the Ameritron is... Uh, I know there's a, a company that says you can put a brick on the key and all that kind of stuff, but um, from a radio engineering standpoint, when I look inside of an Ameritron amplifier, I see nothing but quality. And um, I think that most fellows that have the Ameritron amps, those amps are going to be running long after the hams are gone. <laughs> so tell us a story about Ameritron, uh, Martin. Uh, I know that um, you take a lot of pride in that company. Let's hear Let's hear an Ameritron story. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> well, we got Ameritron, oh, it's been over 20 years now. We were buying, um, I think we were buying meters from the company that made the Ameritron amplifier, which was Prime Instruments, and in, I think it was in Cleveland, Ohio. And um, he had taken over Ameritron uh, from another company, uh, I think, as a way of being paid for products that he was selling to that company. And uh, it became available, so we bought it. And at the time, it only had a few products, and we've expanded that line to what it is today. But Ameritron sells more um, amplifiers than any other uh, amateur radio amplifier company. Uh, it really started to take off when we introduced our line of 811 amplifiers, which were very affordable amplifiers, and it would put out 600 and 800 watts, which was plenty of power for, for the hams to talk to whoever they wanted to at very low price with very rugged tubes. And um, But you're right, that AL1200 uh, is a super reliable uh, amplifier. It's got a power supply in there that'll handle 2,500 watts, and it's just loafing at its rated power. Well, okay, uh, uh, Martin. Well, I've got one of your AL811Hs. Uh, and, man, if that power supply is that big, I need to put me about four more 811s in there. Well, I was talking about the 1200. Oh, oh okay. I'm going to I'm have to upgrade then. All uh, right. You know, the, the uh, solid-state amps that we make uh, have 50-volt um, uh, 
supplies by those FETs. So it makes it much, much more efficient than the ones that are using 12 volts. Yeah, okay. We, we, amplifiers, oh. let, me, let me just ask this question. You have the, uh, the AL-1200, you have the uh, AL-1500, and you have, um, um, I'm trying to think the other the other model, but anyways, one of them has a 3CX 1500 in it. Uh, one amp has a pair of 3500s uh, in there in grounded grid, and also the, um, of course, they're all grounded grid, but uh, then there's the AL 1200, which has the 3CX 1200. Why don't you tell the folks a little bit about the difference in those amplifiers and my why someone might want to prefer one over the other. Okay. <clears throat> well, the uh, ones that use the 3500 tube, that's a very classic tube, very rugged, and um, over the years it has been uh, an inexpensive tube. Tubes now are much more expensive than they used to be. Um, there's not very many manufacturers anymore. Uh, there's still iMac, and there's some Russian tubes and some uh, Chinese tubes. Um, but the um, 3500 is low cost. And to get a uh, full legal limit, you need to put two of those in there. Now, we have uh, one that's really popular, the AL80B, which uses a single 3500. Um, the 1200 can put out around 1200 watts. It's a very rugged tube. And if you even if you overdrive it, it, it doesn't hurt the tube. Now, the uh, AL1500, the 3CX1500, is capable of a lot of power, and it also has a lot of gain, so it only takes a very small amount of power to drive it to full legal limit. Um, so gain, ruggedness, low cost, difference, differences in the AL82, um, which uses the 3500s, and the AL-1200 is rugged, very rugged one. And the AL-1500 is the one that has a lot of gain and is very sensitive. Well, here's a couple of questions. Uh, one is, do you have any plans to build a 100-watt amp for QRP rigs? Well, we do. Um, uh, uh, the plan is to take the solid-state amps are made up of modules and we're going to take one of the modules out of the um, uh, AL, ALS 600 or ALS 1306 and um, make a single module. It still uses two FETs and push-pull, so it would be a very nice, very clean amplifier. It just takes time for us to um, design it and get it through FCC, but we do plan to come out with one. And uh, MFJ uh, has one that we're, uh, it's in the process of going through FCCs. It's a much lower power one for, um, for QRP. So what, what's the most popular uh, amplifier you have out of all your amps? Well, it was the AL811 line. Uh, the 600 watt one and the 800 watt one are the are very popular, um, but the one that has really caught on is ALS 1306, which is a uh, 12, 1300 watts uh, fully solid state amplifier that will cover 160 meters through six meters, and it puts full power out even on six meters. Um, it can read the data from your radio, so Whenever you switch bands on your radio, it'll switch, uh, it'll change the band on on the amplifier. Uh, it's a very well received amplifier. Now, does your does your HF amps go up to six meters? Uh, mine doesn't. My 811H does not. Uh, no, the solid state amps, the 1306, the new line of amplifiers will go up through to six meters. Okay. Ted, uh, you had another question? Well, let me, uh, let me just say this. 
um, Martin has a line of antennas. Of course, there's, he's got, <laughs> he owns all these antenna companies. But uh, some years ago, I mentioned to him that back in the days of, <coughs> excuse me, Citizens Band Radio, I had this uh, antenna. It was called the CLR2, and uh, it was made by High Gain. And I really loved that thing. It was just incredible. I knew he'd bought the high gain company, so I, I asked Martin, I said, Do you still have the plans for that or can you build the equivalent of a CLR two? So anyways, the next year when he came to sit out at the booth and we started talking, he started telling me the story that now you can get that antenna and uh what was really surprised me is when I talked to him the last time he told me about the thing does a pretty fair job on 20 meters and 17. So, Martin, tell us a little bit about this classic antenna that you sell today. Okay. I, I think you're talking about the 5H wave uh, antenna that uh, works, uh, what well, was designed for the 27 megahertz band, <clears throat> but it can be adjusted for um, the 10, 12 meter band directly. And you can tune it with an antenna tuner and so that it'll work all the way from 20 meters up through uh, 10 meters. I mean, it's a really good working antenna. Well, in the, in the Citizens Band days, it was, um, it was considered a classic. I think antenna specialists made one called a Super Magnum, and then this was the CLR2. Now, how it got its name, I have no idea what CLR2 stood for, but it had that little top hat on, on the top and uh, the uh, radials on the bottom. And those antennas were, um, they were, they were just under 20 feet, because at the time, you were allowed to put, uh, an antenna could only be 20 feet over the top of whatever structure it was mounted on, so those things were just under, just under that 20 feet limit. Uh, and I'm curious if you know how all that worked out or, you know, why they were why they were going for just the, the, the 20 foot. Uh, I, I don't know. I guess it was the, the legal limit thing. But back then, Citizens Band was booming, and they were selling a lot of those antennas. Well, you know, that's, that's a, um, a link that makes that antenna a 5H wave. Uh, which is the maximum gain for a uh, single element an antenna like that. But you're right, they had that other limitation of height, too. But, you know, the FCC um, did not allow metal antennas for the citizen bands, and that was the reason they disappeared from the market. So we are not... Uh, and when we don't sell it for the citizen band, we sell it for the 10 to 12 meter band. And it was because of it's made of metal, which the FCC doesn't allow to be sold in the citizen band. Now, I was not aware of that. Well, do you know what the reason for that is? Well, I think it was had uh, problems with people uh, not using those antennas right and putting those too close to the power lines, and uh, people were getting electrocuted. So, Martin, uh, here's a question, uh, just a real quick question about your answer again. Uh, I think the question is, how important is it to have match tubes in these amplifiers? Well, um, well, most of, let's see, the ones that we're using are being used in parallel, so I don't think the matching is all that critical. Well, I was going to say, over the many years that I've built amps and things, I never matched anything, man. I, I just pulled out of the junk box what was available and stuck it in there. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think it's that critical. <clears throat> uh, they want to know who's making the transformers uh, for your amps now. Well, they were made by Peter Dahl, and we found another transformer company that built it in pretty much exactly the same way. So they're they're just as good as they used to be. Uh, I think the company uh, transformer companies are out of Chicago. All right. 
Ted, we're, we're kind of working something different, Martin. Ted's in Nashville and I'm in Memphis, and uh, you can see we, uh, we haven't uh, uh, gotten real proficient on how this thing works yet, but uh, go ahead, Ted. Well, uh, the, the thing that, that, uh, that gets me is, is, you know, today, we just don't have companies like MFJ around. I mean, I, when I was a kid, I remember the Olson catalog. I don't know if you folks remember that. And, of course, Lafayette Radio Electronics would put out a catalog, and so would Allied. And these were like dream books, you know. You had to sit and read those things for hours, you know, especially if you were a kid, because you could only imagine what it would be like to have some of these things. Of course, now I, I have a... Uh, I have an MFJ grid dip meter that I love to death, and I've got uh, I've got a couple of other things. I mean, I've got, for example, the I don't think I mean I don't know. I work a fair amount of CW, and I've got um, I've got one of Martin's uh, paddles, and I've got the uh, MFJ keyer here, and I don't know what model it is, but if I scoot across the room, I can tell you real quick. Um, and I you know I want to say that there's so many. Products. It just says MFJ Deluxe Elect. Oh, here it is. Here's a model number. It is a 407D. I'm using that with the MFJ uh, 564 paddle, and I absolutely love the combination to death. I mean, they are absolutely incredible. And uh, and you know what? You can. You don't have to take out a loan <laughs> to get set up for CW. The the price on this stuff is is really reasonable and I've worked a lot of keys and and, uh, and, and maybe some some people have a uh, you know more refined touch or something but I'll tell you I um, I said the, the paddle is very very smooth the keyer works extremely well and um, why don't you talk a little bit about the various types of keys that you have and uh, some of the the keyers that uh, that you you make there at MFJ well yeah uh, line Keyers that range from um, um, very low price and very small um, to memory keyers um, where you can store messages and you can vary the uh, side tone pitch and the side tone volume and um, uh, uh, all these are iambic keyers that would generate dots for you automatically, generate dashes for you, and um, generate the space. Uh, the iambic key uh, concept is where you can push the paddle to one side and start a dash, and before the dash is finished, you can push it to the other side to generate a dot, and the keyer will automatically form a dash of the correct length and then automatically form the space and then form the dot. So it makes sending um, uh, Morse code really uh, easy. Um, uh, and the paddle that we have is it's um, it is just makes it so easy to uh, uh, send Morse code. Um, but we've got uh, uh, complete keyers with built-in paddle uh, that sells for as low as $69. That's a peak keyer with a paddle built in uh, that can fit in the palm of your hand, maybe two inches by two inches, to keyers that has... Uh, a code reader built in so you can send Morse code and then if you are not comfortable with copying it Morse code by ear then you can just read it off all right uh, Martin um, let's do something okay uh, we're we're going pretty long tonight and uh, I'm worried that we might burn out the shortwave transmitter. You know, that thing's been keyed up now for about an hour and 27 minutes. So, uh, anyway. Uh, uh, yeah, I was going to say, though, with um, with some of the things that uh, uh, that Martin has, the things that, you know, like, let me ask this question. Things that guys need to have in the hand, ham shack. Now, I don't know. To me, I think that everybody ought to have a grid dip meter. 
everybody ought to have a uh, you know an oil filled dummy load. Uh, what what are those things that, that you guys have that are the basics that you think everybody ought to have in their shack in order to survive? Let's call them survival tools. <laughs> okay. Well, I think you mentioned the basic ones. I think the basic one they should have is an SWR analyzer, an antenna analyzer, so they they can, uh, I mean, it's a complete set of instruments in one. If you take one of our SWR analyzers, you have a signal generator, you have a frequency counter, you have a way of measuring SWR, you have a way of uh, reading the antenna resistance and the antenna reactance. You've got a complete troubleshooting instrument and uh, <clears throat> to uh, make sure your transmitter is work, working good. You, you need to have a dummy load and um, need to have an antenna tuner, uh, especially one that's got a built-in uh, antenna switch, built in uh, dummy load, and uh, we have uh, automatic tuners like that and also uh, manual tuners like that. Uh, uh, the uh, antenna tuner with all those things built into it is a basic piece of equipment that uh, you need to have in your ham shack. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, well, my sons went and did some traveling. They were they took off across the country, and each one of them went separate ways. I mean, at different times. They always want to borrow the uh, differential T tuner I've got because it, it has the coax switch on it. It's got forward and reflect meter on the front. And it'll tune just about anything. I mean, you can put a piece of balanced line on it, which is usually the way they use it. Um, but anyhow, I was going to say, those antenna tuners are, uh, are unique because they're totally, completely self-contained. But now the, uh, the, the differential T that I've got, I don't know, I think you've started making bigger ones now. And if that's the case, tell me a little bit about those. Okay, well, differential T is uh, really popular because it only has two knobs the tune. Uh, <clears throat> now, because it has two knobs, you have to accept whatever cue that will allow you uh, to get the SWR down uh, one to one, but that's okay. Uh, you just turn two knobs and uh, the SWR will go right on down uh, one to one, and uh, it just makes it really easy. Now, the advantage of the tuners that has three knobs is that you can set it for a low Q and have a wider uh, bandwidth and uh, be able to handle uh, more power. But it's harder to tune a uh, tuner that has three knobs. <clears throat> now, the tuners that are becoming real popular are our line of automatic antenna tuners. Um, the ones that we have um, can handle uh, uh, power very safely and very reliably uh, because of the components, heavy-duty relays, heavy-duty capacitors, uh, big toroid coils. And we're bringing out a whole new series, um, uh, the new model, the MFJ939, is a plug-and-play antenna tuner. It's a complete, uh, uh, fully automatic tuner for $159. And all you do is plug in a cable from the tuner into your radio. And then as you, you're tuning your radio and transmitting and operating, the tuner is learning your antenna and the way that you're operating. So you can set that uh, antenna tuner uh, under the table, and you would never even know that you have an antenna tuner. The only thing you know is, no matter where you're operating, your SWR is low, and it's fully plug-and-play. Uh, you don't have to connect power to it. It takes it from the radio, and it's got uh, 20,000 memories, and uh, it has, um, I think it's eight virtual uh, uh, antenna uh, memory banks, which means if you use an external antenna switch, you can connect up to eight different antennas to it, and it will assign 2,500 memories 
to each one of those antennas. Anyway, 159.95. It's an incredible uh, piece of equipment. I, I'm going to have to get me one, Martin. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've got a, a loop uh, tuner. I, I, I was looking at that, and I was just wondering. Uh, tell us about that thing. Now, that loop is uh, looks like it's a, a pretty good size loop that you could make. Um, and then um, this this tuner you've got is, I guess, designed to tune that loop. Yeah. Well, that's you know that's a very interesting product, and it really works well. Um, it's it's a we have several versions of it, but basically it's a box with some knobs on it, and you make a loop. You take a uh, thick, heavy-gauge wire or some big conductor. You take some copper tubing, but you can wrap that around a door, make a large loop out of it, and uh, you don't need a ground system, and you can have a complete transmitting antenna. And uh, it's really easy to use. It's got a um, RF uh, indicators on it, tell you when it's all tuned up. Um, but you can operate uh, any band uh, based on whatever size loop that you want to put put on it. You can hang it on from a curtain rod, and you can make different uh, shapes of loop. It doesn't have to be round, um, but it's. Um, uh, what makes it so unique and different is that you can put up any size loop that you want, including a large 80-meter loop, and be able to tune it. Now, we also make a completely self-contained loop that will cover one of them from 40 meters through 15 meters, and the other one's from 30 meters to 10 meters. And that's a very high-efficiency loop where everything is completely welded, including all plates of the capacitors. So, Martin, are you going to introduce any new products uh, come Dayton? Uh, yeah, we've got several new products that we're introducing, um, uh, but we'll introduce those uh, at Dayton. All right, so we're not going to get a first uh, peek at them here, huh? Okay. Well, we'll we're going to see you up at Dayton, and we've got you scheduled for some time on our show uh, from Dayton, so we're looking forward to that. Hey, Martin, I, I, I noticed uh, people can't see much, and I know you can't turn your camera, but you're a big collector of vintage radios, and over your shoulder, uh, we're seeing, I'm seeing some of your vintage radios, and, and guys, I've been in Martin's office, and all those uh, bookcases are full, they're full of radios, he's, uh, look at there, Martin's moving his camera, he's got a remote control camera there, he, uh, he's got a lot of vintage radios there that he collects, uh, it kind of brings back some memories. Uh, one or two of them are, are radios I had when I was a novice over 50 years ago. And uh, so, Martin, uh, you must like old radios. Oh, I love old radios. I've got radios from all era. I've got some some kind of uh, interesting and rare stuff. I have a piece of equipment. I'm not sure if I can move over there where you can see it, but it is... The first piece of transistorized equipment that was made for ham radio, which was made by Regency, who also made the very first uh, transistor radio. But this was a converter for your car. You know, back back in mm -hmm. the uh, 50s, if you wanted to operate mobile, uh, you had to build a separate transmitter, uh, and then you would have to have a receiver. And a lot of the hams used a converter uh, that would convert that ham band down into the AM broadcast radio band. And what this was was a um, a uh, converter that allowed you to do that. I've also got a – what we're looking at right here is a uh, <clears throat> HRO receiver. If you look uh, – down toward the bottom, there's two handles, and that is a complete set of RF coils that you pull out completely and replace it with another drawer to change bands. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
Well, I, t I tell you, and I remember Regency, I think they came out one of the first uh, uh, two meter solid state radios, I think the HR2, if I remember correctly. So Martin, a uh, question here, uh, man, uh, they want to know when you retire, I guess, is the company going to keep going when you retire or are you going to take it with you? Uh, well, um, I plan to be around forever. All right, man, I know, I know, okay. Oh. I see I see a Drake TR something up there on the shelf, and uh, I notice an old Halicrafters radio right there, and I don't know if that's a is that an S forty? I you know I can't remember the numbers of half of these things. You're you're exactly right. That is an S forty A. The S forty A was the one that had a um, uh, flywheel on the tuning knob, so you could spin it. And it would just keep turning. Uh, but I've got some night kits. Uh, it's on the other shelf. I, I don't think I can move a camera over there, but there are some night kits, a bunch of heat kits. Uh, I even have some old Lafayette radios and some Ally radios, things that we, that we wish we had when, when we were kids. But if you look back there, there's a Miller, Millen tuner. And there's also a um, the original. Um, let's see. Uh, well, you can see some Helicrafter uh, radios. The, the 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 radios that I like to collect are the low end novice type of radios, the kind of radios that we wish that we had when we were kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I noticed the two, uh, the two Heath kits there, and I don't know their model numbers, but they had, uh, uh, I think they had variable receive, and then there was a, a crystal socket for transmit, I think. I'm not sure. I see a Halicrafters receiver there and a Halicrafters uh, CW transmitter, and it looks like, I don't know what that is up on top, but I, I, I can spot those real easy. Those, are, those stand out. Yeah, no, that, the one on top, I think, is the S-107, this Halicrafter. One right below that is a SX-140. These were 1960s, and the, the transmitter below that uh, seemed like there was an HT-140. But to the left of that is also some, uh, some Drake radios. The uh, 2C, I have a 2B on this other shaft. But on the very left end is a Harvey's Wells transmitter that was back in the 40s and the 50s. Um, right above the uh, Harvey Wells transmitter is an old Gonset converter. And uh, right on top of that um, um, Drake transmitter, the 2NT, is a set of um, Morse code uh, paper tape that they used to use to teach Morse code with. Uh, see, I forgot what it's called now. I can't. I can't remember what it's called either. But I know. I know exactly what you're talking about. I see the two NT. But now underneath that two NT, what is that under the two NT? Uh, that is a Drake 2C, not the Drake 2B, but the Drake 2C. It's partially tubes and partially transistors it was during that transition stage. Those were, um, um, well, the transmitter was the novice transmitter, and the 2C replaced the 2B. Which was, and the 2C was not a, as good of a receiver as the 2B. I'll tell you, the, 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 the owning the old radios, I have a, a pair of Drake Twins, which is the uh, T4XC and the R4C, which I don't really know what the difference is between the Cs and the Bs. Um, I know the Cs are, are uh, newer, but I don't know what the Bs... I think someone was telling me that you're, you're better off with a 2B receiver than you are an R4C, but I don't know why. But uh, I've got several TR4Cs, 
And uh, one I'm I'm uh, upset with right now because it sticks in the transmit position. I can't get it to, when you let off on the mic, it won't go back to receive. So I've got to get in there and pick around with a relay and find out why it's doing that. But that's one of the problems with these old rigs is the fact that you just you could spend your whole lifetime just fixing them, you know. And as soon as you get one thing fixed, it's something else. But there's that, I guess, just looking over on the shelf and seeing the thing sitting there, uh, there's just something really, really cool about that. And I, I, you know, I, and I, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, I like the new radios, but um, there's just something about like when you, what you're saying is when you were a kid, when you wanted one of these things so bad, <laughs> yet you couldn't afford it, you know. And uh, so there's something about collecting them because if you couldn't have them as a kid, you know, maybe you can afford to get them as an adult. And I think that's what I've been kind of stuck with. <laughs> I, I, I'll go to a ham fest and I'll say, oh, I've got to have this. I've just got to have one of these. And it's got to where now when I bring it home, I'll look on the shelf and I already had one and I done <laughs> forgot about it. So I don't know if you have you had done anything like that, Martin. Uh, I'm sure you have. I've got two or three of, of the same thing, of a lot of things. You know, if you look look on the right-hand side, there is... Uh, that gray box, that is the first transmitter at Heathkit sold to the hams. That's an AT-1. <clears throat> and uh, I have that Drake 2B there uh, up here somewhere. <clears throat> oh, there. I saw that Heathkit transmitter, and they made several that look very similar to that, but I can't remember the model numbers of them, and I can't distinguish one from the other, like on a, a video picture like that. But they made several. There was a, I don't know, a 25 and a 35 and um, different yeah. ones of the CW transmitters. Yeah, they did. There was a DX20, DX35, DX40, DX60s. They were all transmitters, and you had to have a separate receiver. I mean, if we get a chance to do this uh, some other time, I can take my iPad. I can walk up to each one of these radios and show you what what I have here. You know, I've got one one radio that's really interesting. Remember the old Helicrafter S38 uh, receivers? I, yeah, I do. Okay. Well, they had an S38 with a transmitter that was built into it, and if you looked at it from the front, you couldn't tell the difference between that and the normal S38. The transmitter controls were on the back, on the chassis, and they used the audio output tube as the final output tube. Uh -huh. that, now, that's amazing. <laughs> now, I've never seen one of those. I've never encountered one. All right, well, guys, we better probably start thinking about ending this. We've gone way over schedule. And, Martin, uh, as always, it's just great to talk to you, man. I, we could spend hours and hours. And what? let's let's do this. Let's uh, maybe in a couple months, let's try to plan on having you on again. And, you know, we may devote the entire show just to you. And then maybe if we can uh, work this thing out, you can walk around with that iPad or whatever and show us different things there, okay? Yeah, that sounds fine. So we'll we'll do that. And, uh, guys, I, I just want you to know, I, I, I think you were probably one of the, the, the biggest success stories, uh, Martin, and you've done it all for for ham radio, and uh, uh, we, uh, we love it. And, you know... Uh, it's hard to believe that uh, you got your start uh, chopping up meat in a meat uh, shop. Didn't you do that? Well, I did. I owned a, a grocery store that I grew up in. This was a tiny little store. It was a store of about, uh, oh, less than a thousand square feet. And uh, we lived in the back of the store. And um, at one time, there were 11 of us that lived uh in the back of that store and uh but i mean growing up what i did was to uh sweep the floors put the drinks in and uh uh but i got a chance to run it when my brother uh wanted to take a little trip and uh, so i ran it for about six months and that's where i learned everything learn uh 
how to take care of customers. So I have a drawing that I'm trying to zoom in on. I don't think the light's going to let us see it, but that's a drawing of the yeah. grocery store. I've seen it. That's a that's a beautiful drawing of your first, uh, of your, your little store back in Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. But that was a great place really cool. to... Uh, it would be to uh, to get Martin to teach a course in um, in how to run a business, you know how how to start a business up and how to run it and all the things that it takes to make one successful. Because he definitely has a handle on that. And I think you, Martin, you ought to write a book or, or start doing uh, seminars or video seminars and, um, and start uh, teaching other people exactly how to begin a business and how to stay successful in it the way you have. It's a, I mean, it's, it's not a common thing today. Businesses fail right and left, but here's MFJ Enterprises. And, and we all know hams are a difficult bunch to sell to. So you've really kind of done the impossible here. And uh, you'd be a, you, you, ought to, you, ought, you ought to capitalize on that. We should have the Martin Jew Book of Business that uh, is released. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, they might be turned into a business, and now the business has turned into a hobby. And I'm just enjoy, uh, just enjoy coming to work. And people ask me, um, you know, when, uh, you know, when are you going to retire? And um, you know, people uh, retire to do what they want. Well, I'm already doing what I want. I've always been retired. Well, I tell you, Martin, uh, great story. We're going to go ahead and uh, get out of here. Uh, it's getting late tonight. I'm going to try to do a little editing of this video, and we'll have it online for people to watch uh, uh, fr from tomorrow on. I know a lot of people uh, that missed us uh, do want to see the interview with you. It's always uh, always uh, a pleasure talking to you, and uh, we're going to Kathy and I are going to get back down down to Mississippi and visit you guys again soon. Okay, that sounds great. I had I had a great time visiting with y'all guys. And uh, we'll uh, we'll plan another. Uh, I'll get with you uh, sometime after Dayton. You know, we're going to see you in about four weeks up in Dayton, and then uh, after that, we'll uh, we'll plan another webcast with you guys. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, any any last uh, words, Ted? I just want to say thanks, Martin. We really appreciate you coming on. Love talking to you. You'll have to come and visit us at the QSO booth in Dayton. We always love to have you come over and sit down and talk about all kinds of things. And I always like to have a catalog with me when I'm talking to Martin because I can't remember all these things, and he can go into great detail. But thanks so much for making an appearance tonight, and we really appreciate your company. Okay. Y'all have a good evening and a uh, great time visiting with y'all. See y'all in Dayton. All right. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and we'll end the call there. Thanks, Martin, for staying up late, late with us. Okay, well, that was a, a good interview, I think, with Martin. Martin has got a great story. Uh, oh, man, we didn't cover probably 10% of the things I wanted to, to talk about. We'll get him back on here again. In fact, we'll probably donate, I mean, dedicate a uh, entire show just with Martin and uh, uh, see if we can't uh, uh, let you guys know a little bit more about Martin and, and MFJ. Uh, Ted, there was a question in the chat room earlier uh, about field day. Are you going to do a field day with your call or something? I'm not familiar with that. We, we plan on it. Now, something happened last year, and I can't remember what it was. It seems like we had a transmitter go down. And, of course, these shortwave transmitters are huge, and uh, the parts are not necessarily instantly available, and you can't count on everything. So if something goes down, it's possible that you can go down and be gone for a week or two, you know, trying to, to get parts and get things back together, especially if you've got bad weather and you've got antenna troubles. Something happened last year. I can't remember what it was, but we always plan on doing a live field day broadcast and uh, have people calling in from all over the country and talking about their, their field day festivities, and uh, we, we just enjoy that. Well, you know, last year we uh, tried to go to four different field day locations and, and stream it on the webcast. 
And I think three of those locations, uh, uh, we, we've got about 10 inches of rain in about two hours. Uh, I was going to sites, and uh, all we were seeing were ducks swimming around the tents. Everybody was up on the picnic tables trying to hold the radios down. So hopefully, uh, <coughs> excuse me, hopefully it'll be better this year. Um, we'll probably do a field day again. Okay, very good. Okay, we're going to go on uh, to uh, the next part of our uh, show here. Uh, we're about really to end the show. Uh, thanks to all of our listeners out there uh, that have been listening to WTWW uh, from Lebanon, Tennessee. Um, if you are listening on a shortwave, you can always go to W5KUB.com where you can watch the show and enter the chat room and talk to us. Uh, be sure to follow us on uh, Twitter at W5KUB and also uh, Ted on uh, at the uh, QSO Radio Show at QSO Radio Show. Uh, let's see uh, uh, real quick. I'm gonna. I've got just a few things here, a few pictures that we're gonna show. We we've got a, a section session uh, about uh, radios and people have sent some in. So let's see who we've got here. Uh, here's. Um, I believe this is um, this is a picture from uh, Clark. Let me see if I can get it in order here. This is from Clark uh, KK6 DPE. He's in uh, Phelan, California. It's a TS520. He's got he's got an MFJ product there. Uh, another uh, Kenwood TM241 and a Kenwood Mike. He's got a Linko. So he's got a lot of different uh, radios there. Um, and let's see. He should get, I got a picture of his antenna. I pulled that off of QRZ, and there he is. He's got about a 280-foot uh, loop antenna that he uses. Uh, let's go down to our next picture. Uh, this is from um, uh, Michael. This is from Michael uh, W1DGL in Prescott, Arizona. He's got a Radio Shack uh, Pro 97. He's got an IC706 uh, Mark II there. Uh, he's got an MFJ product. Look at there. He's got an MFJ949 antenna tuner and an MFJ Club 20 CRP uh, uh, radio. And then we got, um, there's another picture of, uh, from Michael's uh, setup there. And then we had one last uh, uh, picture come in. This is from uh, Ron Wright. Uh, I don't have Ron's uh, information or his call, but uh, that picture was sent in uh, from Ron Wright. So um, don't forget, we're going to be at Dayton, Dayton Hamvention webcast starting May 13th through the 17th. The actual uh, Hamvention is Friday through Saturday, but as you know, we will webcast live our drive as we go up there the 10 hours. Uh, our friend astronaut Doug Wheelock will be with us with us again this year and co-host our show on May 15th. And we've got a lot of prizes to give out to our viewers there. Join us on Facebook. There's a button under the chat room. Join us on Facebook. Um, uh, now it's time. We're going to, uh, basically that's the end of the, the show. But uh, we have what we call roundtable now. And uh, that link I sent, I will send a link out again to everyone. If you click on this link, if you click on this link, yeah, you and you have a camera, you should be able to uh, join the show. Your video and audio uh, will be on the show here, and people will be able to see you. So uh, there's the link. If you guys can go ahead and start getting on. If you guys get there before I do, uh, just uh, hold me a spot. Okay, help us spread the word about the webcast. Thanks to Ted, uh, thanks to all our guests, and uh, we'll see you next Tuesday. And uh, we're going to go ahead over on uh, that link and see if we can find somebody uh, uh, and throw them, in, throw them in the round table here. Send me three to everybody. It'll take me just a minute to uh, to get on. 
We probably have people already in here. The show went very long tonight, guys. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. You can see we got a couple different camera views for you tonight. That's uh, that's our right side right there. And uh, if I can get my production uh, technical production manager, left side, give me the left side camera. There we go, left side camera right there. How about upstairs up there? Can you give me the upstairs camera? There we go. That's uh, that's from upstairs. Uh, we we just did that for a little bit of fun right there. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go back and see if we can't get in get in on the uh, round table. Guys, I just, can you guys I hear just me? I just got my ticket in the mail today. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Hey, how you doing? Uh, we've just about got you guys up on the webcast. Uh, let me. Uh, let me change something here. So don't say anything that you don't want them to hear. Well, if you look in the background, I've got four MFJ 989C stacked. Do you? Yep. All pre right. Pre-tuned for a pre-tuned for a 525 foot loop. Oh, yeah. Okay, we got uh, we got you guys on here. You're on the uh, you're on the round table. So who we got in here tonight, man? We've got well, there's Don. Hey, Don. How you doing, Don? Uh, let me see here. <laughs> uh, one of these should be in here. And... All right, Don, we'll come back to you in just a minute. Oh, there you go. You look, man, where are you? You're in, uh, 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 you're in, uh, where's that place to get all that water? Uh, uh, Las Vegas. Uh, it doesn't look like Las Vegas. Italy, what? Italy or where are you there, man? Uh, I, I'm, I'm going down the canals of the Venetian. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's there you go. There you go. Very good. <laughs> the thing hey, is, when blind. you're in Vegas, you're, at, you're, you're everywhere. You're in New York. You're in Paris. You're yeah. in Rome. You know, it's, uh, right now I'm in, uh, in Venice. All right. Well, you know, here's where the fun, here's where the fun starts on the, uh, the webcast right here. Everybody's watching us right now that watch the webcast. So you guys are on. So uh it's going to be uh, a lot of uh, funny and different comments i'm sure with with this group of guys here hey i saw uh i saw freddie on here a minute ago where did freddie go i lost him yv5 qf man okay well let, let's see who else is on here we've got uh there's 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 don's on here he made it in to hang out and then we got the Charlie, other Don. Hey, how you doing <laughs> I finally had a link in my email that I clicked, clicked on and it worked. Oh, really? Cool. And yeah. then we got the other Don out in California there or Venice or wherever. And then, hey, Dan, how you doing tonight? <laughs> doing good. Doing good. How are you doing? Doing, doing good. And, and then, Bill, now where are you, Bill? And 3HQB in Hagerstown, Maryland. He's in Maryland. And then we've got uh, uh, Ben. Where are you, Ben? Uh, I'm in Indiana. Indiana. I'm, I'm waiting on my call sign. I just took my technician's test on Saturday. Great, great. Welcome. All right, man. Hey, let, we'll come back and talk to you in a minute. Let's jump down here to Freddie a minute. I see Freddie there. There's there's Freddie, YV5QF. Hello, Freddie. Hello, Tom. How are you? Doing good, good night, man. You, you, you're coming through good. Fre you guys okay. probably you guys yeah. probably recognize Freddie. Freddie uh, uh, helps us out on the webcast, and he'll be going to Dayton with us here. So hey, let's let's come back down real quick, just just for a quick down down to Ben. Ben, so you took your test and you're waiting on it, huh? Do you do you? Yeah, yeah. Um, they said it. I should. I might be able to see it on Thursday if it pops up. Yeah. Do you uh do you have any radio gear yet? No, I've been talking. Actually, I don't have any friends that are in ham radio, and I don't have any family, so it's really been hard for me. But I, I did meet a guy when I took the test. Mm -hmm. uh, down in Indianapolis, who is uh, an extra, and I've been asking him, trying to get ideas of what type of equipment to get. Well, look, you know, uh, once you get that license and you get your radio, uh, you'll have a whole new family that you'll join. You'll you'll join the the amateur radio family there, and uh, you'll get a lot of help. Uh, it's a it's a fun hobby. I've been in it for about fifty one years now, and. Uh, uh, you know, you don't have to start off big with just a little bit of money. You can, you know, I'm not sure what license you've got right now, but uh, even with a, a technician license, okay. 
uh, you don't have to start off big and you'll, you'll have a lot of fun and uh, you can upgrade and uh, you'll be talking to the world here pretty soon. Yeah, I'm stepping for the general now. Well, that's that's good. And hey, there's uh, there's cousin Brucey. I see cousin Brucey in up in uh, New Jer New York, New York. I almost said New Jersey. Man, you forgot where I am. <laughs> that's really bad. Okay, hey guys, I want to tell you we we got the prizes out. We we got the prize list out to everybody, and I copied you an email. So uh, if you want a prize during the Memphis Ham Fest, uh, it should be coming. Uh, you looking good tonight, Bruce. So, hey, I'm going to back out. You guys go ahead and chat. And, hey, Don, is this the first time you've been in our uh, our hangout at the end of the show? It's definitely not the first time that I've tried, but it's the first time I've actually been able to make it in during the time that the hangout is going on. Uh, it's uh, 8 o'clock right now in California and, and Nevada, and I have two nets at 7.30 and um, uh, another <clears throat> net at 8 o'clock. So, you know, I, I keep pretty busy on Tuesday nights, but sometimes it's kind of hard for me to get in. Plus, if I, if I don't have a link in an email to click on, sometimes uh, I've I spent a half an hour fooling around trying to figure out how to get into the right Hangout. Okay, well, I've started just publishing it to the public uh, the last week or so. And sending and putting it out as an event, uh, the amateur radio roundtable event. So uh, you should have it probably a couple of days before. Hey, there's some questions in the chat room. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Ben, uh, you got a lot of congratulations from uh, people in the chat room. One guy's suggesting go with the Yezu gear. Um, uh, here's another guy. He's working on his extra class now. And uh, W5TXR. Uh, said congratulations on passing the test. Thanks, everybody. I I just put a link in the chat um, uh, for the Ham Radio Hangout group. Uh, okay. There, Ben. That would be a great place uh, if you got uh, time. Uh, we meet every night uh, in the Ham Radio Hangout group, and uh, just pop in there and be more than happy to answer questions for you. Well, it's a good hangout. I try to pop in here at least uh, every every night myself. Uh, I'm I'm one of the regulars that bug the guys. Uh, I think sometimes they they hate to see me coming. I give them demerits if they uh, if they don't do the things I I want them to do. I'll, I'll usually issue these guys demerits. And Bruce uh, Bruce has got to hey, Bruce. You were up to about a million demerits last week. Yeah, I know. All right, that's so why won, so that's guys, why I won our prize, right? That's well, I don't know. Hambot picked you, and you you, you can't you can't bribe Hambot. I can tell you, I, I you just can't do it. So you know the show tonight. I I don't know how. I tried to keep the audio levels as as close as I could to being right. I know a time or two they spiked. Um, we had all different kind of interfaces coming in. We had telephones coming in. We had Skype coming in. Um, it, it just and um, I, I think it went okay. Uh, I heard some noise on a couple of the connections. I was hearing some noise. Don't know where that was coming from. It may have just been an internet connection I, problem. I don't. I don't know. But uh, we always enjoy talking with Martin. I thought the audio was fine. The only, the only part that seemed deficient was when the, um, when uh, Ted was talking during the uh, NAB, uh, the broadcasters convention. He was a little light. Yeah, I noticed that. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, Ted and I are going to have to talk. Uh, I noticed a couple times he was low, and then a couple times he was much louder. Uh, and again, it may be that I didn't have his mixer level turned up enough but uh i think it worked pretty good um we're trying to determine you know how best to make this show work uh this is our second week to uh to uh, simulcast it on shortwave and um so you know we wanted to bring shortwave listeners in all of us got our our ham start probably listening to shortwave and uh 
so we're, we're thinking that, uh, that this might might be a good program for shortwave listeners to to also tune into. I can't tell that that many are coming from the shortwave over to the to the uh, the video. I don't see the numbers increasing just tremendously, but um, I think they'll build up over time. I think it was a great try trying to get uh, Martin to spill the beans on his new products at Dayton. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know. Uh, hey, hey. I, you know, uh, Bob Heil. A couple times, Bob has uh, gave us a, a peak preview and announced on our show a new product before he uh, he announced it uh, anywhere. But uh, I haven't I haven't talked to Bob in a while. I think he's he's out this week uh, out at the NAB. Uh, did any yep. of you guys see the uh, the, the the very first uh, uh, segment of the show at the NAB? Any, any you guys for that? Well, I saw uh, Bob Heil at the NAB today. Uh huh. Where do they hold that out there, Don? What's the venue? Uh, it's the uh, the main uh, Las Vegas Convention Center. Uh, they take up the North Hall, the Center Hall, and the South Hall Upper and South Hall Lower, so they're um, they're in all those venues. Uh, the Sands Convention Center is the one that's going to be um, hosting the uh, International Security Convention that I'm going to be going to uh, the rest of the week. But um, tomorrow night, Wednesday, is the um, there's a ham radio uh, hangout uh, at. NAB that's uh, sponsored by a, a couple people. I know that uh, Bob Pyle has sponsored it in the past, but I didn't notice him on the sponsor list this year. But I also went by the ARRL booth that is in the um, the area between the North Hall and the Center Hall. I, th I think that uh, NAB is probably the second largest convention that I come to here in Vegas. Um, the largest is the uh, Consumer Electronics Show. And um, uh, it, it covers all the venues that NAB covers, plus the venues over at the Sands Convention Center, uh, plus uh, in a couple other hotels for for private meetings. But NAB is always fun, and uh, I don't understand why Tom is not here. I mean, he's a broadcaster. They've got a, a lot of things that would make his job easier, including people he could hire to, <laughs> to run the the uh, video mixers and streamers and stuff like that, but uh, you know, for a, a modest investment of you know seven to twelve thousand dollars, you know, uh, you could move this uh, this uh, webcast to the next level, Tom. Yeah, you know, I, I, I was hoping, and when we were talking to the guys at the beginning of the show, we we were talking to the guys there at the at the NAB, and they were showing us the equipment and. Uh, we kind of hinted to them if they would donate some of it for our show, it would it would greatly be uh, used, and we'd appreciate it. I don't think we're going to get anything out of them, though. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Ham Nation started uh, uh, with uh, one sponsor, and they, you know they have a lot more sponsors now. So, uh, you know, you're on the road. Well, you know, I, I and, and I tell you. Uh, I'm not sure how long I can do this, man. We're we're in about the ninth or tenth weekly show. We hadn't missed one yet, uh, but man, it's a lot of work. I'll spend three, at least three full days, you know, trying to get guests and talking to them and getting bios and pictures and just loading everything. So it's turned out to be a lot of work, actually. Uh, I need to find me a couple locals here, and and Kathy helps me a lot. I mean, she. She uh, does things like the, the recording and, and some of the cameras and uh, watches the chat room and helps people when they have trouble with their accounts. But uh, I need to uh, I need to hire me uh, some help to get over here and uh, you know help run this thing. So uh, so you know I don't have to do it all because I, I I'm real disconnected. You know I'll be interviewing somebody and and it'll look like I'm not paying attention because I'm I've turned my head somewhere else and I'm turning knobs on something. You know. Uh, that's, that's not well, it's hard good. to work behind yeah. the camera and in front of the camera at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the advantages that Ham Nation has is they've got the guy working the TriCaster full time, 
switching between the different video feeds and keeping the audio levels uh, good. And all the on-camera talent, uh, you know, is is freed from that, uh, you know, trying to run their pr production and be in the production. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, uh, how was your cruise? When I was out in L.A. here back, I think, in October, you were going on a cruise. Man, I missed you. Well, uh, that's the thing that kept me from actually going to the uh, the live event at Last Man Standing. Uh, but I did get a, a lot of people checking the chat room, and I sent out around 50 QSL cards from the special event to people that have checked into the um, the video streaming that uh, that was done with with my equipment that I had loaned. Uh huh. Uh, so I'm not sure, you know, uh, you know, how many people you had uh, checking into your chat room or whether you sent out QSL cards or or what. But I, when I talked to John Amadeo, he indicated that um, uh, Papa wasn't going to send out QSL cards, but uh, John went and sent me a, a stack of, of QSL cards, and uh, you know I uh, I set those all out on my own, um, you know, with one of my QSL cards and one from the special event, and I've gotten maybe a dozen uh, QSL cards in response. Yeah, so, I know. There's uh, now yeah, we didn't send out any cards, but we had uh, that that would surely break us probably, but. Uh, I know people on here like Bruce there, uh, there in New York, and several others have, have uh, well, you know, worked the station, and they've been trying to get a QSL card for for six months. They've sent two uh, self-addressed stamped envelopes. They're still not getting any cards back. Well, the uh, John sent the uh, the stack of cards to me in bulk, and then I took care of all the postage to send all the cards out to all the individuals. So. Uh, I just uh, I wanted to do that as a thank you to the people that had checked into the chat room and uh, you know, were able to participate. There's a lot of good comments in the chat room. So you uh, you didn't send you know, cards enjoying being able to see the, yeah. the stations. You didn't send cards out to everybody that made a contact, did you? I I sent a card out to everybody that logged into the video chat room. Right, right. Not everybody that made a uh, RF. Contact. Right, right. There's a lot of people that's looking what for those. Papa's supposed to do. Yeah, I, that's what I'm saying. They're supposed to do that, and they're not. And and, and guys are sending them uh, self-addressed envelopes, and they're, they're still not getting anything back. So, uh, you know, I I guess they're a little slow. Well, maybe but, I'll uh, have to talk to Cecil. I, yeah, I might have to talk to Cecil. He's the the head guy for the Papa system. I see him about once a month or so. Yeah. And. Uh, I'll show him my special event station QSL card and then my stack of QSL cards that I got back from uh, from people that uh, you know enjoyed getting the card, getting my card.